few times. Oh no. All right, we're good to go. Phew. Sweet, okay, take two, sorry about that guys. All right, today we're going to be talking more about soil components and looking specifically into the weight and volumetric relationships. Uh, a lot of this stuff will sound familiar from when we talked about aggregates and a little bit when we talked about the geomaterials in our CE materials class. Uh, because again, like when we're talking about granule soils, basically what we're looking at is just really, really small aggregate combined together um, with a different mixture of other stuff too. Um, so the purpose of the, this lecture, um, before I get into the reminders and stuff, again, like what we talked about earlier this week and last week, uh, there's a big aspect of geology involved in geotechnical engineering, you know, the geo aspect of it. Um, but where the geologists kind of camp is, is in qualitative analysis. So they understand the deposition, all of the important like intangibles of how the soil got there. Um, but where we come involved is understanding the mechanics of it. Um, so these today and then the next couple lectures, we're really going to be focusing on some of those index parameters that assign a numerical value to a qualitative property. So like if you were to pick up soil and, uh, and be like, oh, there's a lot of voids in this. There's, there seems to be a lot of voids. Like a geologist would be like, yes, there's a lot of voids. But the engineer needs to act, like actually have a quantifiable number of how much voids there are. So we develop porosity and void ratio. So then we can assign this a, a number value to it. So again, that's the whole aspect of changing from a geologist standpoint to then assigning numbers so we can use math and all that fun stuff. So week two reminders, again, there's no lab this week. So that only pertains to the Thursday crew. So no lab after this. Um, the first lab section is gonna be next week. Again, that's gonna be in the geotech uh, room over there, 1305 or I don't remember what, the exact number. And again, just wear like stuff you would wear to a, a lab where we are going to be working with soils the first week. Um, so keep that in mind. Yeah, contact the lab groups if you haven't already. If there's any issues with that, let me know and I can get that sorted out. Um, and then we are going to start our quizzes this week. So right after this class, there's going to be a short like five question quiz posted. Um, and yeah, this again, the purpose of these is just to make sure everyone's staying up to date with the course content um, and kind of, you know, highlighting the important aspects of what we taught this week. So that's gonna be due Friday at midnight. You can use your notes, um, don't, you know, work together, try to like work in, and by yourself and understand, because this should be really be a balance of how you're doing in the class. You know, it's worth 10% of the class. It's really, really not worth that much, but it's important like gauge to see um, if you're understanding and comprehending that stuff. All right. Oh, another thing I talked about last Tuesday, there was a really scary geology video that I grew up watching and I actually found it on YouTube, probably illegally, but it's there and I wanted to share it with you guys so you could share in my uh, fifth grade torment, but it's, it's on there. It's, it's just, it's super 90s. So like the, the cringe of the 90s is, is fully in there. So feel free to watch that if you want. And, and yeah, it's, that's all I'm gonna say about that. All right, uh, today we're gonna to be uh, focusing again in the soil components and then the volumetric side of relationships. Again, assigning numbers and assigning quantitative values to qualitative properties. So voids, moisture, all that fun stuff. So I talked about last lecture, um, the brief definition of geotechnical engineering. I already said this about five times today, but I'll say it again, we are assigning the mechanics so that mechanics, of course, is understanding the math and assigning uh, different relationships so we can predict the way soil is going to behave when we load it with different types of structures. Um, that's the whole point of it. If everything was just trial and error, um, then we'd be losing a lot of money. We need to assign some type of value where we can predict the response of loading um, on different types of soil stuff. Um, but the whole aspect that we talked about before was the importance of understanding the geology behind it, specifically on understanding the patterns within different types of soil, so we can better predict its behavior. So uh, understanding the types of weathering that brought the soil or created the soil, the mineral composition of that soil, 
um, and then how it got to where it currently is. So is it a residual soil, which means it stayed in place? Is it, was it transported by a glacier? Was it transported by wind? Was it marine sediment? Is it a fluvial sediment? All that stuff, we see very similar patterns in the me mechanics between soils from that classification or that type of transport group. So again, what we talked about was the type of weathering here um, too, and the, the two major ones, the physical and the chemical. And you'll see throughout the semester or in your career, like the type of weathering also plays a role in the type or the strength or other properties that we care about um, from soil. Does anyone else hear like a cracking coming from the ceiling? Okay. As long as it's not like the structure or something, that'd be kind of ironic <laughs> talking about that. Um, so we mentioned uh, geo geo yeah, geologic maps. And uh, the use of these, and you guys will probably see these a lot in your career, no matter what state you work in. Um, again, if you're either working as a geotech or you're going to be working with a geotech, they'll probably throw this in some of the reports. And it's good to remember what exactly this is showing. This is only showing the general trends based off of deposition. So again, deposition is how it got there. Like, it, was it a marine sediment? Was it fluvial? Was it glacial? How it got there. And then composition too. So these are all the qualitative aspects. There's no numbers involved. The only numbers are that geologic age and all those fun big words that we talked about last time. Um, but still, it's important to understand because these are showing the regional trends. So this is something that you would look to at least anticipate the type of soil conditions you might find at your site. Um, but again, geology is important understanding, but it does not replace the subsurface investigation. So as an engineer, you would never just look at this map and be like, we're good to go. I know what type of foundation to put at, on the structure now. You're always going to have to go and poke holes at the site and understand the subsurface conditions within your project location. Okay, so that's what we talked about last time. Um, let's get into the soil components. Um, so does anyone know what this is right here? A picture of it? Yeah, yeah, that's sand. So, all right, you guys have a good weekend. Um, that's gonna be it. So, um, so again, if we can probably picture what like soil looks like or what sand is. We've all been to the beach. Praise the Lord, we live close to a beach. Um, but if we were to actually look and zoom in at it, like same as aggregate, we would see it combined of two things. We would see it consisting of a solid material and a void material or area where there's no solid, and that is void. And then we see the voids consist of either air or water. Now that's for this class specifically. When you get into advanced, if you want to make a lot of money and get into petroleum engineering or something, obviously there's more stuff in the soil voids. But for the purpose of this class, water and air is really going to be the two things. We're not going to worry about gas or petroleum or any other types of contaminants or anything. Um, but the important thing here, again, is because we're looking at just the qualitative relationship. You could say that a soil like this soil has a lot of water in it. This soil has a lot of voids in it comparatively, but we need to assign a numerical value that actually represents that qualitative relationship. So what we do often, um, and that you've probably remember from uh, the aggregate is we consider soil as three phases. So we have a three phase soil diagram. And again, for this class, we're using three, if you look in some advanced textbooks or you know, later on, if you decide to do advanced degrees, there's different phases. People look at different types of water and that stuff, but this class, three phases. So what we're doing is assuming three things when we look at this. We are assuming that the mass of air is equal to zero. So you can see there's a mass section and a volume section. These three phases, solid, water, and air, all take up volume and all takes up space but only two things take up mass, the mass of solid and the mass of water. We're also assuming that this is a homogeneous material. And this is one of the assumptions that allows us to make a three-phase diagram. We're saying that all of this solid material here is the same solid material 
We don't care about the difference between that. All the water is the same density water. Um, so if it's homogeneous, each one specifically is just one material. And that allows us to assign a single value of density for air, a single value of water or density for water, and a single value for a single value for density for the solid. Again, looking at that picture, you could probably see, or on the previous page, looking at that picture, you probably see it looks like there's different minerals within the soil, right? Like there was some big rocks, a bunch of sand and stuff. Um, and so technically, this solid material is going to be an average conglomerate of a bunch of different types of material. But when we're looking at it from just a phase diagram, a simplified phase diagram, we're assuming it's all homogeneous. And um, the other thing that we're assuming when we look at these phase diagrams, you might remember this from um, the asphalt side, but we're assuming that the solid is, need a red pen, that's not work. is not absorbent. So it does not absorb water. Um, remember the aggregate when we were talking about um, asphalt, there was like some of the asphalt binder that overlapped this phase diagram with the aggregate. Um, for this case, there's no overlap. The solid material, the sand, little tiny sand grains, little tiny clay grains or whatever, they're going to be separate. There's no overlap of water into the solid like we saw before. Let's see, is there a way like to mute this thing? All right, whatever. So in engineering practice, um, we can measure a couple things, right? And we'll see this through the whole lab. Like we take a scoop of soil, we can measure the total volume. So we can measure like the bucket that was used to retrieve the volume or the volume of the hole like that we took the soil sample from. We can measure the mass of water um, by putting it in the oven and then burning all the water off and measuring the mass after, just like we did in the CE materials lab. And we can also measure the mass of dry solids. Those are usually the three things that are super easy to measure. And then from those, by understanding the density, we can, under, we can calculate the volume side of things as well. So that's where that density relationship is really important. And this is why I really tried to stress the understanding of density and unit weight in the CE materials class, because you're gonna use this relationship a lot in the geotech uh, world and also in your day-to-day -day life. You know, like that density is the bridge between mass and volume um, through this diagram here. So the reason we care about density um, is the strength and the density of soil are correlated and they are generally linearly, linearly correlated. So as density increases, our strength of the soil will also increase. And this is due to the granule nature of our material. Um, if you think about like what we're basically doing, if this volume isn't changing here, and we are packing more solid material into that volume, then those solid material, those little rocks are going to be tight, tighter together and there's gonna be more friction between them. So it's going to be harder for them to slip and slide past each other. So the higher the strength in general for this class we'll see is correlated to a higher dense object or soil in our case. So there are important ratios that are calculated from this phase diagram for the strength estimation in geotechnical design. So what we're gonna be doing a lot in this lab and introducing today, again, is understanding the quantitative behavior or quantifying the behavior of the soil. And then eventually we'll see how those values that we're calculating are used to estimate the design strength of the soil. And then from that design strength of the soil, we estimate the loading from the structure and we see if the soil will be strong enough to support that load um, underneath it. So some of these ratios um, are void ratio that we'll talk about, porosity, the degree of saturation, water or moisture content, which we should probably all be familiar with from the CE materials class. It's the same thing. The unit weights, and then the specific gravities. And we've talked about specific gravities too already um, in 
the CE materials. So again, you'll see a lot of overlap between aggregates and soil in this case. Um, but these are super important and these are all simple ratios um, that a lot of um, that you know that engineers like are going to need and are super critical for um, calculations of design and, and everything. Okay, so void ratio. Did we talk about void ratio at all in CE materials? Does this thing sound familiar at all? What could you guess void ratio is telling us? Solid, right? Yeah, yeah, void to solid, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a property illustrating the voids, the amount of voids and quantifying the amount of voids in a um, soil sample or aggregate sample or anything. So the void ratio is a ratio of the volume of voids to the volume of solid. So if we look at our little diagram here, volume of voids and volume of solids. So these two things here. So we represent this by an E. It's always shown as an E. Pretty much all textbooks are gonna show it as an E. And of course that's just shorthand VV over VS. So it's expressed as a decimal point, as a decimal. I've already shown it here, but since we're working with two independent values, VV and VS, even though they're divided by each other, it can be technically from zero to infinity, right? Like there's no upper maximum um, range here because if we have like a piece of sand dropped in a pool, you know, the voids are exponentially larger than that one solid. Um, so technically it could be higher. Generally though, what we see here is from sand, it would be anywhere from 0.4 to one. Clay, it could be like usually a wider range. Um, and then organic soils, depending on the organic soils, it could be really high. I, I've personally never seen anything higher than like a 2.5 or a three, but um, you know, again, that comes into the variability of the geologic conditions that you're working in. So some, some areas might have these massive um, void ratios. So the void ratio, as I mentioned here, um, as it decreases, the density increases. So if we think about it again as the equation, um, more voids equals the VV goes up, right? It becomes more of a loose condition. And if we increase the VV, that's the numerator, so the value goes up. So again, just it'd be helpful if you keep those in the back of your mind, the general relationship. relationship. Um, higher void ratio means a lower density. So less material, more voids, that stuff. So there's another one that's very similar, and this is porosity. So porosity, what does that, like just hearing that set word, like what do you think it is relating to? Porous. Yeah, the pores. So it's, a, it's very similar to void ratio. We're looking not at the voids, but we're looking at the pores, which are pretty much the same thing. But you'll see um, later on in, the, in this semester that the porosity is looking more at um, the, or is, is not looking at it, but it's, it's more, relevant to the permeability. So the what like it's used in water, like it's used for like flow of water and everything. But the porosity is very similar to the void ratio. We still have the volume of voids in the numerator, but now in the denominator we have, sorry, the total volume. So void ratio are two independent things. The porosity is the volume of voids here divided by the total volume there. And we express this as a fancy N. It honestly doesn't have to be that fancy. It's more just like, like that calibre font generally, but 
volume of voids divided by the total volume. Um, so what we do is express this as a percent. So generally we will multiply it by 100. And it makes sense because we're dividing by a total volume, right? Like, so basically what we're show, tell, saying here is what percent of our total volume are voids. So this can go between zero and 100%, right? Because if, again, the pool example, if we have 99 point or like, you know, a bunch of voids and one drop of sand, our total volume is staying fixed. And since that is the numerator, the max it could be, or the denominator that the max it could be is 100. Um, so what we'll see, um, or what we, we won't go through the whole thing, but um, the void ratio and the porosity are obviously really closely related. Um, so we know the void ratio, or sorry, the porosity is N, that's the volume of voids divided by the total volume. But we know the total volume itself is actually equal to the volume of voids plus the volume of solid. So what we can do actually is switch this through and plug in the void ratio in itself. You know, since the actual the void ratio is, sorry, the porosity is technically, sorry, the void ratio is right there. And what we get through the power of math is this relationship. So I don't expect you to know this proof, but what I want you to see is eventually we can simplify this relationship to relate the void rate or the void ratio and the porosity. And you may be wondering, okay, what's the purpose if these two variable or um, variables are so close together, what's the purpose of calculating these two things? And for this class, there, there really is, isn't a good answer. Like <laughs> this is all gonna be dependent again, like on some correlations that you'll see in the future. Permeability and the ease of water to flow through it or water storage is usually easier to be represented through porosity, density, and the strength is easier to be represented through void ratio. So in this class, you'll be focusing more on uh, void ratio. So I'll just do this for geotechs. Generally, we care about void ratio for hydro geologists. So if you start looking in like hydraulics or anything like that, they'll generally care more about porosity and stuff. That's just the way the equations and the research is set up to understand it for. All right, degree of saturation is another one. Does anyone want to guess what this is telling us? It is telling us what, how saturated, what is the degree of the saturation? <laughs> At least these names are a little bit easier, but um, <laughs> yeah, basically what we're telling us is how saturated the soil is. So obviously they, the soil can be maximum saturated, which means it is full with water. So what this is telling us is the volume of water. It is the ratio of the volume of water. Sorry, H2O. Let me just keep it simple and do water. Divided by the volume of voids. So what we show this is, is an S for saturation. And this is volume water divided by volume of voids. So we see right here, just looking at these two relationships, we can see the volume of water, or volume of voids is equal to the volume of water plus the volume of air. So the max, if we can never have the volume of water greater than the volume of voids, right? So this is expressed as a percentage. And of course, the maximum possible range is between zero and 
So again, understanding what the equation is made up of, volume of water can never be greater than the void space that it takes up. So um, zero to 100 percent. So um, if it's oven dry, so if there is no water, who wants to guess what the degree of saturation is? Take a stab in the dark. Zero. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> See, all these make sense. If it's up fully saturated, so no VA equal to zero, then this is 100. There we go. This is equal to 100%. So who remembers when we were doing that compaction stuff, that zero air void curve that we had to do? Again, that is the 100% saturation curve. So we only have two things, solid and water in our soil sample. See, geotech is easy, guys. So um, the densities are important. Um, generally, we're going to assume, you know, the water table, we go and, and dig like two feet down outside, we'll hit the water table, right? Um, for this class, let me just show it here. This is depth. Here's our house. For this class, what we're going to assume is anything below the water table is equal to a saturation of 100%. Anything above generally will have some value between 0 and 100%. So unless it is completely oven dried, what we're assuming is any soil that is natural will have water in it, you know, like, and that's where the moisture content and everything comes into play. But what we're going to do just to keep it simple is anything below the water table um, is going to be 100% saturated. That's groundwater table. All right, this one should be familiar to a lot of you guys. The water content. So this one is either represented by a fancy little W or an M dot C, or sometimes some reports you see it dot W dot C, but then people get it confused with water closet in Britain, the toilet and stuff. Um, but for this class, I'm gonna try to keep it as a W because that's what I'm used to representing it as. So the water content is of course the mass of the water divided by the mass of the solid. So now we're going over to the weight slash mass side of things. And these two here. So again, this could be either way. It could be the mass or the weight. And then what we do is we also multiply this by 100%. So it's expressed as a percentage. But this one, they tried to trick us because this can technically be greater than 100%. So all the stuff that your sixth grade math teacher taught you about with percentages, forget that for, for this one. They, they try to confuse us. So if we look again, WW and WS, those are two independent things. You know, there's no total in the denominator. So those two values can be whatever they want. So it can be, you know, zero to infinity. Um, most natural soils, let me just write that here again. Can be. So always check that. It can be greater than 100%. Or like, don't be like completely freaked out if you get a value greater than 100%. Uh, most natural soils will be less than 100%. Really rare. Um, but I, I don't remember if I was saying that in this class. Some geologic formations, especially out on the West Coast, like if you decide to work in San Francisco. Um, there's a, a few like really famous or geologic formations out there that um, just have super high water content, super high moisture contents. There's a case study um, recently, like a condo, a giant condo high rise in San Francisco has been like sinking really slowly. I think it's been on the news a little bit, um, but that's because the soil formation, the Young's Bay, Old Bay, Young's Bay formation, um, just has like super crazy high natural moisture contents. So there's issues associated with that. Organic soils though, this stuff can be like from 50 to like. So in Florida, um, if you've done any work in Florida, again, 
organic soils out the wazoo. Like we, we have them all over the place. So doing this moisture content test, you may see like in the 120s, 150s sometimes, and generally um, that's gonna be a red flag because you're gonna have more water than you do have soil. And I don't like, I'm pretty sure we can probably all swim, but I'd rather be standing on like soil than water, you know, if you think about it. So generally the higher the water content, the more issues you're gonna have because the more water you have compared to something that's actually gonna support your structure. Okay, so um, also what we see too, generally sands will have greater, sorry, less than, less than clays. So it generally goes something like this for moisture content. And we'll talk about this whenever we um, get into like the structure of clays, the difference between sands and clays um, and, and that kind of stuff. All right, so um, just like in the CE materials class and what we talked about before, the densities are really important too. Um, and I just wanted to again illustrate the differences between density and unit weight. All we're doing is changing that numerator. So unit weight is really just equal to the density times the acceleration G of gravity. So a lot of times I will just use those two terms interchangeably. And I apologize if that confuses anybody, um, but if I'm doing it too much and I'm, you know, saying weight slash mass and you guys, you know, just have me stop and I can explain it again, but they're the same because this G value here, gravity is just a constant, right? 32.2 feet per second squared or 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, so since these two values are the same, basically we just show them interchangeably. Um, and the reason why we do that a lot is because who knows the density value in the USA, right? Like for pounds and stuff, density values. Does, has anyone heard these, heard of this before? Slugs. Yeah, right, yeah. Probably not many of you guys heard of them because we don't use this crap because it's slugs. And that's like, who wants to call something a slug? So generally pounds is what we'll consider our mass because we'll just multiply it by gravity instead. So density mainly used us and then but everyone else had it a lot easier because they like milligrams and kilograms is a lot easier to understand weight wise than kilonewtons or something like that so anyways based off of this um, moisture states then obviously we're going to have different types of densities that are important if we were just to take everything as itself like so this whole volume and then everything that's inside of that volume that has mass, then that would be our total or our natural density. So in aggregate world, so if you remember from CE materials, this was in geotech world, we just call it natural density. So going outside, taking a cup of soil, picking it up with that cup, taking the volume of that cup and everything that has mass that's inside that cup, dividing those two, and that's our density, right? So just natural total density. Um, but there's also other aspects of it that we care about. Our solid will have a density itself. So just looking at the volume and the weight that takes up our solid section. And then the water will obviously have a density itself too. And the good thing about water is we already know the density. Um, density in is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter or 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, right? If we're working in US stuff, does anyone know the slug comparison for water density? Wow, I honestly didn't know. I was hoping that's interesting. <laughs> I was gonna say. Oh, really? Oh shoot, now I feel bad. All right, well, you have to memorize now. <laughs> If he asks, you have to memorize that too. No, um, I'm going to keep it with 62.4 pounds per cubic foot because you're never going to, at least my experience working, you, you never see slugs or anything like that. Um, so yeah, these two things, try to memorize these. Um, or another one would be 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. 
right? Because gravity, 9.81, so you just do the 1,000 by that. So yeah, so these two densities are important and we're gonna be using the water a lot. Um, so just like we see here, it's the same thing as this, same thing here. I apologize if that confuses, but the gammas versus the rows, so the density versus the unit weight, they're gonna be used interchangeably in, in this class. So the um, there's a few other ones. We also have our dry density. So this is generally what would be produced from our oven. So in the lab, you'll see like we take that cup of soil that we just took from the ground. And in that cup of soil, we have soil so or solid water and air. If we put it in an oven for 24 hours and that all that water boils off or evaporates, we're assuming the solid stays the same. So what we're left with is only the mass of the solid and the total volume. So only this, but we're talking about the entire volume still. So this is different than our density of the solid, right? The density of the solid is just the volume of the solid. The dry density is still looking at all of the soil constituents, but now we're only left with the mass of the solid. So again, it could be shown as this too. Solid divided by the total volume. So this is weight of water is equal. Ugh. Weight of water is equal to zero for this. Oh my gosh, it's spreading. So when we oven dry it, we're assuming the weight of water is equal to zero. All right, saturated density. If our two cases, our saturated density is in almost opposite of the dry density. So that's when all of our water is taking up the void space. So what we do is we still include the two things, the mass of solid and the mass of water. But now this mass of the water almost needs to have like a little asterisk here. And this is when the volume of water is equal to the volume of voids. Um, and luckily we can calculate this pretty easily because we know the density of water. So if we can understand the volume of water, we can understand or we can calculate how much mass of water it would take up to fill that volume, right? By using the density relationship. The other thing we're gonna see, um, well, we'll see this in an example too, so, so don't worry. Um, other thing that we see is submerged density. This is shown by a prime, at least in this class, it will. It's equal to either one there. But this is if we were to take that cup of water that's saturated and then stick it underwater. And this is also like similar to the buoyant force. Like it's gonna want to float. So the density changes um, in our design like aspects. Okay, so these densities here, if you remember, um, Densities are often represented in a different form, um, and that is our specific gravities. Um, and really, these are just kind of a short ratio, a shortcut way of representing the density. Um, it's a unitless value, so it helps if you're working in different units. You can just multiply it by whatever unit you need of density to get the density of that object. Um, so this is a unitless number. And it's the ratio of a material's density to that of a water's density. So this is an easy thing to determine in the lab. We're going to do a lab uh, like to actually calculate this GS, the specific gravity of solids. Um, and this is really helpful because then we can easily calculate the unit weight or the density of the solid itself. So again, this is only the solid density. It's not the dry density. It's not the total density. It's just that solid. So if this material 
here is a certain material then um, it's going to have the specific gravity of that material itself the solid material so what we'll see and i think i already said this but oh my gosh this is crazy so most soil is what we call would be like a mineral of quartz base quartz and so this specific gravity that density of quartz is going to be set of like 2.65 that's the density of quartz the mineral um so we work at the mineral mineral level but then we move up and uh, it's still representative of the entire solid um, in this. So so in, that would mean if our GS of soil typically is 2.5 of the solid material, that would mean, right? So we could calculate the density or the bulk unit weight of that solid just by doing this. So what is this telling us that quartz is? Like quartz is technically 2.65 times more dense than water. So that's why it's this reference substance. So if we have something, if we have a GS value of like 0.9, what's gonna happen to that substance if we put it in water? Yeah, it's gonna be less dense than water. So it's going to float. Um, so just keep that in mind. A GS value less than one will float. So GS greater than one, more dense than water. So obviously, like this is something that will help like you know check when you're calculating this like just think of the material itself like uh, if you've ever picked up like limestone or or anything or like concrete or any rock you know like if you get a gs value of a thousand that means it's a thousand times denser than water so just you know think think about it physically like when you're actually calculating this this value um to double check it should be within the like you know two to three range for most material that you come across with in soils. Okay, so um, these are some of the things that we're going to see and we'll see the importance of this specific gravity value is because this helps us get from volume to mass and vice versa in the phase diagram here. So if we have a volume, and we need to calculate the weight that it takes up and we know the density or we know the specific gravity then we can translate between the two like we did in the ce materials class so just like the aggregate section for that what we are going to be um, what you need to know for this class is how to fill out these phase diagrams and then how to calculate the void ratios porosities and all the important index parameters um, from these things so i listed out these steps here you don't technically need to follow these steps if you have your own way, but the goal here again is to fill out all of the aspects of this phase diagram, all the weights and all the volumes that you need. So first you would list the information that, you've know, that you know that's given to you. Draw the phase diagram, obviously. And then the important thing is if no mass or volume is given, then what we can do is assume a unit value for one of these and again this is only if no mass is given or volume so if you're given a total mass you cannot assume a total volume but if you're not given either one if you're not given total mass or total volume then you can assume one of those and we'll see it here in example two so you'll fill in one side of the cross or the diagram um and you know just trying to fill in the blanks here but you can always cross over the dent using the densities and again that's because we know gs is equal to the density of that substance divided by the density of water that density of the substance is like weight of solid divided by the volume of solid 
So if we need to calculate the volume of solid here, you see this relationship. So then like weight of solid would equal, right? Something like this. And now we have these two terms that we can either switch the equation around to solve for. Like we, you guys have probably seen All right, next then would be to write equations, always check units and reasonableness of your answers. Again, like the range here, I think I already said this, but we know the total volume of soil or the, just the density of something, the density of water is 62.4, right? So generally it should always be within 62.4. Does anyone remember the density of concrete or the unit weight of concrete? 150, yeah, so it'd be 150 is, is in pounds per cubic foot. Soil is rarely more dense than concrete. So anywhere between this range should be something that you see. So check the reasonableness. Always like think about what the physical meaning is between these things we're calculating on a paper and that will help you know make sure that you're not putting in the wrong number. All right, let's look at an example here. Okay, so this one, um, we are given certain things here. We're given the water content of 18%. We're given a natural unit weight. Again, this could also be just considered moist unit weight. Some people call it that. I'm gonna try not to say that word as much as the textbook says it, but just keep in mind that could be what you, you see it as. Um, so a natural unit weight of 118.5. And we also have the specific gravity of the solids we're asked to find the dry unit weight, the void ratio, and the degree of saturation. So what we're gonna need here is our phase diagram and start filling this out. We know our natural unit weight, we're given that value 118.5 pounds per cubic foot. This is equal to the weight of the solid plus the weight of water divided by the total volume. Our moisture content, is equal to the weight of water divided by the weight of solid. And then we multiply it by 100 to put it in percentage form. Our specific gravity is the density of the solid divided by the density of water. And since we're in US units, our density of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So PCF pounds per cubic foot. So what we need to first start filling out or what we need to find is our WS. What we need to find is our Vs and pretty much all the volumes um, in that case. So it's gonna be really common to give you these two things, the density and the moisture content. These two things are easy to obtain from the lab um, and they tell us a lot to find the weight of the water and the weight of the solid. These are the two things that have those two weights in them. So since we have two unknowns and we have these two relationships here with known values, we can solve these two to find each value. So we can find the weight of solid and the weight of water, All right? So the easiest thing to do is to set up a relationship here with the, the moisture content. Let me just change the color. So from our moisture content, we know that the weight of water is going to equal 0.18 times the weight of solid, right? Does everyone see how we do that? Just move the weight of solid from the denominator up and then divide by 100. And now that we know that, we can plug this in to our second equation here. So now we have, we can, if we plug that in, we will have only one unknown in that whole thing. I'm going to go through that kind of quickly here. So we have 118.5 divided by our total volume. So for this, we will plug in our equation one.
And so we don't know our total volume. So what are we gonna do here for this? Yeah, we're gonna assume a unit one or a unit volume. Since we're not given a total mass and we're not given a total volume, we can assume our volume side, our total volume is going to be one. So VT, we'll just say is one cubic foot. One cubic foot there. Now we can solve for our WS. So the weight of the solid is equal to about 100.4 ounce. So luckily we already have a relationship up here between our weight of our solid and our weight of our water. So once we know our weight of our solid, we just plug that back into our equation and we can find our weight of our water being about 18.1 pounds. So this is a good place to stop and just check and make sure that you're, you're still on track here. Think physically what we're talking about again. We know the density is 118.5 pounds per cubic foot. So if we have this mass, 118 pounds, and this is fitting in one cubic foot of space, then obviously the two things that have weight should add up to 118.5, right? Because we're talking about just one unit here. So if these values, WS and WW, were like either super low or super high comparatively to the density, then we would have an issue and you would go back and, and check your work or something. So again, think of it physically, like 118 pounds fitting in a cubic foot. So think about adding 100 pounds of water or 18 pounds of water, 100 pounds of solid and making sure that those two add up to, uh, to the density. So we have those now, let me see if I can fill that in on this side. This is 118.5. Let me put volume over here. So we're doing one cubic foot for that. Our water is 100 or 18.1. So now that we have our mass side completely filled out, we can switch over to the volume. Um, so how do we go from mass to volume? Specific gravity. So we go, we use density and we get the densities from the specific gravities. So we know the unit weight is the weight divided by the volume for our solid. We're told that GS is equal to 2.72 for our water. Our GS is technically one, right? Because the weight of or the density of water divided by the density of water is one. So for unit weight of water, we know it's 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. For the unit weight of solid, it is GS times the unit weight of water. So two or 2.72 times the unit weight of water. So we know that the density is 169.7 pounds per cubic foot. So we know the weights and we know the density. So we can rearrange this equation to find the volume. Volume of water is equal to the weight of water divided by the density of water. So that is 18.1 divided by 62.4. That is equal to 0.29 cubic feet. And then we do the same thing for the volume of solids. 
And I'm just going to put that here, 0.59 cubic feet. So again, what we do here is another check. Our total volume we said was one cubic foot. So these two values that we have, the volume of water and the volume of solid, make up that one cubic foot. So they shouldn't be greater than one cubic foot. So do that check again when you get to this spot. If your VS or your VW is greater than one, or if you add these two up and it's greater than one, then something happened. And it's most likely in the specific gravity issue, like the calculator problem or, or something. Um, so, so double check that always. So what we can do now um, is find the, all of the volumes. So we know on the volume side, the volume of solid is 0.59. The volume of water is 0.29. So we can still find our volume of air just by subtracting those two values out from one. Because again, we are assuming a total volume of one. So one minus the volume of solid minus the volume of water is equal to the volume of air. So we see the volume of air is 0.41. So this is our air right there. Does that make sense, everybody? Cool. Okay, so. Now we can find everything we need to find. So just to recap, I'm going to plug all these back in. We have 118. So this is our weight in pounds. This is our volume in cubic feet. So we, since we have this density, we know that 118.5 divided by 1 is the density there. Um, we know this is composed of 18.1 for the water, 100.4 for the solid. Volume here, volume here. Yeah. Yeah, the point 0.4. Yeah, you're right. This too yeah i think on the previous one that that should have been the volume of voids not the volume of air right right here this isn't 0.41 that's volume of voids so point five nine minus point two nine. So 18, so 88, so that's going to be 0.12. Yeah, so then the volume of voids should be 0 0.41. Yeah, my bad. Is that, you, everyone see that, that switch up? Sorry about that. So yeah, the volume of air is 0.12. Okay, so, so this is 0 0.41 for the volume of voids and then point two nine. yeah. Okay, so now that we've completed everything, it's just plug and chug for the things we need to find. So we need to find the dry unit weight. Dry unit weight is the weight of the solid. This is crazy. Weight of the solid. I need to just put like a box over that section so I don't try to write there. This is 100.4 divided by one. So our dry density is 100.4 pounds per cubic foot. And this makes sense because it's less than our total, our moist density, our natural density, because we're removing water, right? So 
Um, it should always be less than our natural because we're removing something that has mass. Our void ratio is the volume of voids divided by the volume of solids, which are shown here. So 0 0.41 divided by 0 0.59. And we always just show this in decimal form. going to be 0.70. And then the degree of saturation, volume of water divided by volume of voids. So that is 0 0.707. And then we show this in percentage form. We'll say this is 70.7%. So again, I would suggest, unless you're really comfortable with all of these, um, to fill, at, fill it out completely and then double check and make sure that all of those numbers make sense. Um, but obviously, we only need certain ones. So when you're more comfortable with filling out the phase diagram, um, then you can jump straight to it and like find the volume of voids only and so on and so forth that way. All right. Let me go through one more example. Um, and throw some curveballs here and use SI units. Um, so the same thing though. So we're given the total density, we're given the um, moisture content, and we're given the specific gravity. And now we need to find a few more things. We need to find the dry density, the void ratio, porosity, degree of saturation, saturation saturated density, all that stuff. So the thing to remember if you're not familiar with our buddies everywhere else in the world, M is mega, so capital M. So this is times 10 to the six. So this is million. That's the best way to remember it. Like mega, capital M, million times 10 to the six. There's six zeros. So this is 1.76 megagrams per cubic meter. Our density, all of these values, dry density, we need to find our void ratio, we need to find our porosity, which is the N, degree of saturation, and then our saturated density. So what we can do first, since we're not given a total volume, but we're given a density, we can assume one as our total volume for cubic meter. Um, and if we have one cubic meter, then our mass in megagrams is 1.76, right? So that's from this value here. Whatever, I'm not writing in that area anymore. So 1.76 megagram per cubic meter. So one cubic meter, 1.76 megagram. Okay, so just like we did before, let me move this a little closer, so it doesn't break. Just like we did before, the first thing and the easiest thing to do is start with the moisture content. So since our moisture content is 10%, which is really just equal to 0.1. When we take it out of, um, when we take it out of percentage form, we know that this is the mass of the solid, oh, sorry, the mass of the water divided by the mass of the solid. So what we can say is the mass of the water is equal to 0.1 of the mass of the solid. This is gonna be the first equation we use. The second equation is our density is equal to, or no, I guess we don't even need the density since we assumed it right here. So our total mass is equal to the mass of the water. And this is equal to 1.76. Jeez. I need to call Geek Squad or something if they're still a thing. Anyway, so we have these two equations now. We can solve for those just like we did before. And what we find is the mass of the solid is equal to 1.6 megagrams. 
and the mass of the water is equal to 0.16 megagrams, right? Makes sense because moisture content is 10%. So our mass of the water is 10% of our mass of our solid. So we have those two, just like we did before, knowing the density um, is going to help us. So the volume is the mass divided by the density. We can fill out this one, we can fill out this one. We need to go over to the volume now. We know our specific gravity here. And then the density of water is going to just be one megagram per cubic meter. Again, they, they made it nice and much easier than us by just doing unit values for that. So for that, we can switch between the two really easily. Our volume of water is just going to be 0.16 cubic meters since our density is one. Our volume of solid is going to be equal to Again, that's using the specific gravity. So now that we have these, we can find our volume of air because we know it all has to equal one cubic meter. So on the next one, I fill out all of those, you'll see here. Have them all filled out. So now we can start finding everything we need to find. Yeah, so first the dry density the mass of the solid divided by the total mass, sorry, the volume. All right, let me go over here because that's the death spot. This is equal to 1.6 megagrams per cubic meter because our total volume is one. Our void ratio, Volume of voids divided by volume of solid. This is equal to 0 0.686. Our porosity, fancy and volume of voids divided by total volume. So the benefit of this Again, is we divide it by one, by 100, so that's 40%. And then degree of saturation, I think I'm safe down here now. Volume of voids divided by, or volume of water divided by volume of voids. That is... 39.3%, show it in percent form. So again, going through these quickly, but if we know this is correct, then generally it's just plug and chug, but always double check and make sure that these numbers make sense. So let's say, what if we wanted to find the saturated density in this case too then? So just a little bonus thing, saturated density. What is so special about the saturated case? Or what, what does that mean? When S is equal to 100%, what does that mean? Our volume of water 
yeah, is equal to the volume of the voids. So we have this whole thing here. And since we know the density of water, we can determine what the resulting mass of that water would be if all that water is filled in the void space, the volume of voids. So even though the equation, if you look back in your notes, it looks like this mass of water plus the mass of solid divided by the total volume, that mass of water should have like a little asterisk there because that asterisk is when mass of water is equal to the volume of voids. So fills the volume of voids. So since the density of water is one megagram per cubic meter, we know that little asterisk is we want it to fill up 0 0.407 cubic meters. So the mass of water when it's 100% saturated is that. So from that, then we can easily 0.407. So that's our mass of the water. We can't forget the mass of the solid. So that's still 1.6 and divided by one. Megagrams. Convert this out to be equal to so again, keep that in mind. Like when you're working with this, um, saturated density should be greater than moist density, which should be greater than oven dry density because you're adding more material and the volume is staying the same. Okay, so that's it. Don't forget about the quiz. It should be posted and available. I think I put it for 10 o'clock. Again, I'll post these lectures um, on Friday. Um, and again, go through this slowly. If it's not making sense, let me know and I can give you some more um, feedback or examples for that. Enjoy your weekend.